Mr. Kill by Christopher Fielden. Read for the Brighton Company of Writers by Jennifer Taylor Lawrence. Mrs. Ethel Wadworth is looking at me sceptically. I've explained clearly that I can't resuscitate the dead worm she's produced from her pocket. She seems to be having trouble accepting my prognosis. But you're a vet, she says. No, I'm not. It says so on your door. No, it doesn't. She surveys me with unmasked contempt. Are you going to save my worm? It's been cut in half. I know that, you fool. I did it with my trowel. Even if I were a vet, there is no way to reanimate a decapitated worm. So you are a vet? No. Ethel scrutinises me with roomy eyes, her purple hair rinse glowing with alien phosphorescence. You look like a vet to me. I've run out of different ways to say the same thing. Thankfully, she moves towards the door. As she leaves, I receive a scowl, 80 years in the making, but I discern a hint of disappointment in her glare, as though she had expected more from me. The door clicks shut behind her. I sit for a minute, as I always do, and consider the patient I've just seen. Could she be a potential candidate for the programme? No. She might be senile, but I enjoy Ethel's visits. She isn't a bad person and, although rude, she often delivers a dose of the unexpected into an otherwise predictable day. With her walking its streets, the village of Dingle Green is a more interesting place to live. Although Dingle Green is a village, there are many smaller hamlets in the catchment area for my surgery. All manner of people come to see me with a myriad of health problems. I have their respect. Dr Charles Hatton is a man to be trusted. It's a position I enjoy. And the wide catchment means I constantly meet new people. People who might be perfect for the programme. It's amazing what patients will confide in a doctor. I learn all their secrets. I'm careful not to abuse this position. I always use the information for the greater good. As I turn back to my computer, I feel an intense pain in my head. It arrives from nowhere. Instinctively, I reach up to rub my scalp. As quickly as it materialises, the pain vanishes, as though it were never present. I investigate with my fingertips, half expecting to see blood. But there is nothing. Feeling slightly disorientated, I reach out and press the buzzer to summon my next patient. The room shifts slightly, taking on a hazy quality. I wipe my forehead. Surprisingly, my skin is dry. Then all is normal. I feel old. I should retire, but I could never abandon the programme. It's my life's work. If it kills me, so be it. Every candidate I discover means lives are saved. What is my life compared to ten? To a hundred? I've probably saved thousands. I want to save more. I will not stop. Looking back at my computer screen, I see most of the details for my next patient are missing. I click refresh. Now there's even less information. It's one of the downsides of living in a remote area. A day trip to the city would be required to source new hardware. What with my work and organising the programme, I have very little time. I jump with surprise as I notice a man in the room, sitting on the chair Ethel vacated. He's watching me intently. 
I didn't hear him enter the room or notice any movement. I feel myself redden as though caught in the middle of some nefarious act. The man is dressed in black, his leather coat long and worn. He has mutton chops on his cheeks, but manages to wear them more like Wolverine than John McCrerick. His hair is dark and streaked with grey. Pallid skin is clamped tightly to his skull, making him look ill. In complete contrast, his stare burns with life. I find it unnerving. I am afraid we're having some computer problems. I say, pleased with how calm I sound. Can I take your name? Kill. I I'm sorry? Kill. I give the man a tired glance. His eyes are piercing grey, the colour of stormy sky. Mr. Kill. OK, forename. Slash. Marvellous. A joker or a liar. I hope he's the latter. It might mean he's eligible for the programme. Middle names? Hack. Mame. You expect me to believe your name is Slash Hack Mame Kill? I look up and wish I hadn't. Mr. Kill's expression indicates two things. One, he is indeed Mr. Slash Hack Mame Kill. Two, if he's asked his name again, I might come out of this encounter one testicle down. Despite spending half my time advising people to quit, I find myself craving a cigarette. Well, your parents must have had a sense of humour, I manage after the silence has become uncomfortable. He smiles thinly. My old man likes Frank Zappa. Now my computer screen is completely blank. I'm sorry, I say as I pick up the phone. Please bear with me. The phone's dead too. From the corner of my eye, I notice the second hand on my clock has stopped moving. Have we had a power cut? I hear things, says Kill. I jump again, this time because his voice is so close. He's pulled his chair towards me, but I didn't see or hear a thing. Voices? I ask. I no longer sound calm. Mr Kill thinks for a moment. Kind of. Do they tell you things? Kill leans forward as though about to impart a dreadful secret. The voices sing to me. I feel my neck crawl with goose flesh at the same time as having to fight the urge to laugh. A picture grows in my mind of the devil singing a lullaby to this man, tickling his chin lovingly with a black pointed talon. The voices are accompanied by guitars, bass and drums. Kill continues. Amazing riffs, rolling rhythms, thundering bass lines. I'm finding it increasingly hard not to laugh, despite Kill's intense manner. Recently, the voices have been singing about you. There's something about the way he imparts this information that makes me feel my life expectancy has diminished. The urge to laugh deserts me. My lips feel dry. I lick them to no avail. Me. I know what you've done. It takes me a moment to digest this information. Done? What have I done? You know, he says. Now I feel like I'm the patient and he's the doctor. I didn't say that out loud. No, you didn't. The voices that sing to me have become one. Your voice. Lately it's been getting louder. Now it's so loud it's drowning up the rest of the band. And I'm a man who prefers instrumentals. This is too weird. I wonder if I'm dreaming... No, dreams hold a certain recognisable quality, something that tells you deep down that it's just a dream. This is happening. The question I can't answer is, what is happening? I fight an unfamiliar feeling. It takes me a while to recognise it as panic. 
I'm usually so collected. My eyes are drawn to Kill's face. Who is this man? He arrived like a ghost and he says he hears voices. Is he toying with me? Usually people who hear things have some sort of mannerism, a twitch or social inability. The chilling thing about Mr. Kill is his lucidity. Then it dawns on me. You're not real, I say. So why are you talking to me? I consider this. Maybe Kill is a figment of my imagination. I've been working a lot lately and feel tired. I close my eyes for a few seconds and then open them. He's still there. I reach out and touch his arm. He feels solid, but there's something amiss. Instinctively, I turn his palm upward and press my fingertips against his wrist bone, feeling for a palpitation of the radial artery. You have no pulse. He nods, as if I'm stating the obvious rather than understanding the bigger picture. I don't need one. His stare bores into me like two spinning drill bits. Then he speaks, as if delivering a punchline he's disappointed I didn't preempt. Neither do you. Bom bom tish. I grab my wrist. There's no pulse. I look up at him, a desperate feeling of incredulousness washing through me. I'm dead? He nods. So who the hell are you? You know who I am. I shake my head. I, I, I'm dead, so you've come for me? No, you've come to me. Your body lies dead in your office. This is Limbo, the place between life and death. I can't take this in. I look around. We're in my office. No, we're in Limbo. What we see around us is a reflection of the moment of your death. Look on it like a warehouse. A holding area for your spirit while I decide the manner of your deliverance. Your death. No. I'm Kill. Death is my father. Death waits for those who've died. I wait for those who've been killed. I feel muddled, as though I have again missed his point. I speak my thoughts, hoping this might aid my understanding. Killed? You mean murdered? He nods. I was murdered? Yes. His patience seems to be wearing thin. Do I care? No, I'm dead. What can he do to hurt me now? You'd be surprised, he says too seriously for my liking. I don't like that he can read my thoughts. I'm finding the lack of privacy unsettling. Get used to it, he says. But I didn't know I was dead until Kill had spelled it out for me. How could someone kill me without realising it? The killer was gifted. He planned and executed the murder perfectly. He gives me the drill stare again. The problem with your program is you only considered the candidate and those they might harm. You failed to consider those who might be negatively affected by their death. Remember your last kill? Yes. It had saddened me, but she had to be stopped. She couldn't accept living with HIV, couldn't forgive the man that had infected her. Being pretty, she used her looks to seduce men and spread the disease. For her, it represented revenge. Well, her father is a retired soldier, said Kill. He saw you leaving the scene. He decided to deal with you himself. Remember the sudden, intense pain you felt in your head? I nod. It was a bullet entering your brain. I rub the back of my head. I can feel no wound, but then, if killed is to be believed, I am no longer in my body. My head is throbbing, again, but no bullet is to blame. I feel confused, cheated. It all seems so unfair. But, but my life's work isn't complete. 
Neither were the participants in your program. I'm familiar with your work. I've met all your victims. Victims? I spit the word. If he were truly familiar with the program, he'd realise there were no victims. More lives would be saved in the absence of the sadistic, selfish, twisted and cruel. And I always carefully consider each candidate, study them, making sure they're appropriate. True. But remember the banker? I look blankly at him. There have been so many. He liked to drink, continues Kill. Killed a girl in a hit and run. I nod. He'd have done it again. He did. You murdered his twin. A sense of disbelief tingles in the pit of my stomach. Could I have made such an idiotic error? Surely not. I was meticulous. I always made sure. You tried. But everyone makes mistakes. Why did you think you wouldn't? Ironically, your arrogance would make you a candidate for your own program. A thin smile touches Kill's lips. I don't like it. He's laughing at me, not with me. So, I say, not hiding my irritation. What happens now? The smile fades from his face and is replaced by a new sombre expression. It indicates that the time for games is over. Now is all about business. I shall ask you one simple question. Your answer will determine your path into the ever. He reaches inside his jacket and pulls out two sickles. One has a shimmering blade of sunlight. The other is the colour of night. They sizzle as he moves them through the air. Are you ready? For once I feel I know what's coming next and this fills me with calm. The confusion I have experienced until now washes away. Kill's manner has changed. He knows I know. I am dead. Eternity awaits. Have I done wrong? No. I have saved countless lives with no expectation of recognition for my achievements. Should I give an answer I believe he wants to hear? No. I can't. He'd know I was lying. All I can do is answer honestly. I'm ready for judgment. Do you admit you did wrong? No. I did no wrong. I bid you farewell, Charles Hatton. Kill moves with fierce speed, sweeping the two sickles in a deathly arch. They plunge into my chest. There is no pain. Kill is gone. My office is gone. Everything is gone. I'm in the dark. Damp earth presses in around me. The feeling is pleasant. I am content in the cold, wriggling forward, eating that which is in front of me, leaving that which is behind me. I feel safe. Everything around me erupts. I feel cold metal in my midriff. Soil is tumbling everywhere. Light dazzles me. I feel a warm hand on my cold body. I wriggle, finding the heat distressing. A pair of roomy eyes peer at me, surrounded by a halo of purple. Oh dear, says Ethel Wadworth. Don't worry, little worm. I know where to take you. If there's one man who can save your soul, it's Dr. Charles Hatton. That was Mr. Kill, read for the Brighton Company of Writers by Jennifer Taylor Lawrence.